All right, good evening. If you guys have your Bibles, you can start turning with me, please, to Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20. And um, <clears throat> just some things, again, if you guys are, that's a little bit too much, that's hot. Um, just some things to keep in prayer. If you guys are available um, for prayer in the morning, we have, we're, again, we, we got our, our uh, two-week prayer wave that we, that we get going once a month, um, to where we just come together in the mornings, we just come together and pray and just let our request be made known to God, and it's really not too much by way of, uh, you know, there's not a lot going on, man, but we got to come together and pray. And prayer meetings, prayer meetings are interesting. There's a, it's a very interesting time for, you know, the body of Christ to come together in corporate prayer meetings. It's important for us to do this as often as we can, so I just encourage you, if you have any time in the morning, um, if you have times in the, you know, if you have any spare time in the morning, but if you can't make it out to 6.30 a.m. prayer, it's, a, it's, I know people got jobs and work and everything else, you can't make it out there, um, then pray with us from home. You know, just, just pray with us from home if you can um, during this two-week prayer fast. It's important for us to do this. There's a no, not a doubt in my mind that, um, you know, we're here and we're continuing to persevere through these difficult times because we've been, we've been a praying people. You know, because we've been coming together and we've been uh, just continuing to be steadfast in prayer. If there's one thing that we do a lot of, it's coming together and praying. So um, if you guys can come out to that in the morning, please do. And um, all right, we're going to be in Exodus chapter 20. I encourage you again, really quick, look at those emails that you're getting. Don't just kind of put them into the trash folder. Look at those emails. Those emails that you're getting um, from the church are important. They're letting everybody know what we got coming up. Uh, what we got coming up for the summertime, what we have coming up for the next couple of weeks and months. And so, you know, just uh, keep yourself updated with everything that we have going on here. So, all right, Exodus, Exodus chapter 20, a lot of important things to cover. And um, we're, I'm going to probably get through the rest of this chapter. We covered uh, the Ten Commandments last week. Let's pray and we will get into, we'll get into this thing. Hang on one second. I think this might be mess with me here a little bit. Heavenly Father, we thank you. Thank you, Lord, for this night. I do pray, Lord, that you would settle our hearts. Lord, that we would um, just come before you this evening. Uh, Lord, knowing who you are, knowing that you have called us for a time such as this. Lord, I pray for your word to go out tonight with just supernatural power, Lord. I pray, Lord, Father, that you would just bless your word, Lord, that you would lift these words right off the pages and into our hearts, Lord. I pray that each person here, whether they're joining us live online or whether they're here tonight, I pray, Lord, Father, that you would speak to all of us, that you would minister to each one of us, Lord. And we're praying, Lord, that in the time that we're in right now, in this age that we find ourselves in, Lord, in, in, in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, Lord, where it would seem that everything is spiraling out of control, Lord. We rest in the hope, knowing, Lord Father, that you are in control of all things. Lord, in the midst of everything that's happening, we're praying for the nation of Israel. It seems as if the nation of Israel right now is in a uh, season of upheaval, Lord, a season of change. Uh, we do know, Lord, that according to your word, these things, Lord, the difficulty and the times in the, in the place of Israel and the state of Israel, these things will get worse and worse, harder and harder, more difficult, Lord, more pressing. So we do pray, Lord, for those, for the remnant that you would save, Lord. We're praying, Lord, that you would just keep them and hold them in the times that we're in. And even then that, Lord, we're praying for the church, for the body of Christ, Lord, all believers, Jew and Gentile alike. Lord, that you would preserve us, that you would protect the churches, that you would protect the body, that you would keep us, Lord. We pray for those in the underground churches, Lord, those who are literally on the run, Lord, those who are meeting in secret places even right now, Lord, those who are on the run for the, for the sake of the gospel, Lord. I pray for them, Lord. I pray that you would give them steadfast hearts and spirits. I pray, Lord, for this night. Lord, that you would speak to us through your word, Lord, this word that was written so long ago, but we know, Lord, that it is eternal. It is forever settled in heaven. 
Lord, these things that we look into, Lord, these are not just stories of the past, Lord. We know that this is your eternal word. And I do pray, Lord, that you would give us attentive ears. Lord, I pray, Lord, that you would just give us hearts ready to receive what it is that you have for us this evening. In Jesus' name, amen. If you have, if you can, just grab your cell phones, turn those things off, man. Just turn them off, unless you're using them as a Bible or whatever. Use them as a doorstop if you want to. <laughs> because they, they go off from time to time. How you guys doing out there? Can you guys hear me okay? All right, good. You guys sure? All right, because I get a little nervous sometimes with the sound. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Exodus chapter 20, we're going to start in um, verse 1. We're just going to go through these Ten Commandments. We're going to just briefly recap some of these things and then we'll get into and we'll start in on verse 18 and God spoke all these words saying I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt out of the house of bondage you shall have no other gods before me you shall not make for yourself a carved image any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth you shall not bow down to them nor serve them for i the lord your god am a jealous god visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me very important for those who believe in generational curses it is a farce for those who hate me but showing mercy to thousands to those who love me and keep my commandments You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. For the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Again, we talked a little bit about this last week, explaining that that is not just using the name of the Lord as a slang term or as a punchline or as a swear. That's literally taking an oath or using the name of God to further yourself or for selfish gain. Okay, that's what that means. Um, it's not just, again, we, we sometimes think that that means, you know, just using the name, the name that's been given above every other name, the name by which every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess, the name Jesus Christ. Some will still, even today, use that as a swear word. That's not necessarily what he means. However, it does apply when you're using it as a punchline. But it means to take the name of God in vain, to use the name of God for your own personal selfish gain. By the way, It's also worth noting that there are many, many, many preachers and teachers around today that do this. They look to use the name of God just to get rich. They look to use the name of the Lord to pad their own pillows, to increase their own bank accounts, to fill churches and do whatever, right? They just use the name of God as a business model rather than a person, and that's unfortunate. And then in verse 8, remember the Sabbath. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor. And do all your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath. The Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work. You, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. Now please note this in verse 11. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and everything in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Now why is that important? Because God knows that people are greedy. And so if he tells you to take a day off, as he told the children of Israel, take a day off, that means you take a day off, and you hallow that day to remember the Lord. You can come together with people in your family. You can praise the Lord. You can pray. You can thank him. You can rest, because the Sabbath was made for man, right? And so it's important for us to get this because he lists everybody in there because he knows that there's going to be somebody somewhere along the line that owns a business, right? Somebody who's looking to get make a couple of bucks on a weekend, you know, maybe charge double stamps on a weekend, right? Somebody's going to look to make some money and say, okay, well, what? All right, so, all right, so God says, listen, not you, not your wife, not your son, not your daughter, not your male servant, not your female servant, not even a guest in your house, not your ox, not your donkey, not anybody. Okay? So he goes through the whole list because he knows the heart of man. Somebody, you know some guy's going to be like, all right, what, about if I, what if I got a rabbit? You know, he didn't, what about that? You know, because you know there's somebody who's looking at, you know, because this, this is how businessmen work sometimes. We're looking for, looking for an angle, right? So he just goes through the whole list and says, nope. And then he says, 
Why? Because in six days the Lord labored. Six literal days. Now this is very difficult for us to comprehend. It's hard for us to come. It's, it's hard for people who take the Bible literally to even think, to, e- to even s- understand what the, the, the vastness, the power of God in creating the heavens and the earth and everything that we see and survey and every living thing on it in six literal days. But that is exactly what God himself says. He says it multiple places. He even repeats it in the New Testament. Six days. I have no problem with that. Some people do. I have no problem, you know, believing that God created the heavens and the earth in six days. I don't care what science says. I really don't. I don't care what geologists say. I don't care about carbon dating because the carbon dating, all they do, listen, I'm just going to tell you, carbon daters are only right when they're right. They're wrong a lot of the time. So when they start to carbon date seals that are only three months dead and they come to find out that it's, it looks like, according to the carbon dating, that it's a thousand years old. That's a real problem. That causes me to doubt the science. Do you understand? That causes me to doubt the science. I'll believe God's word over the science. So, six days, six literal days. Verse 12. Now, honor, honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God is giving you. Now, remember in Ephesians 6, this tells us that this is the first commandment with a promise. This is the first commandment given with a promise. And he says, honor your father, honor your mother, honor your parents, and the reason so that your days would be long upon the earth. This is no small thing. How we treat our parents and how we treat our loved ones is no small thing to God, regardless of how they are. The sinners that have been saved by grace or the sinners that we have been put under, the sinners like us, people, men and women who suffer from various ailments and character deficiencies, okay, parents who are absolutely sometimes just crooked and wrong regardless of how crooked and wrong they are they are the people that the lord has chosen to make our parents and for that reason because you're still alive because your mom as imperfect as she is your dad as imperfect as he is in all in many 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 ways and i'm not invalidating trouble i'm not invalidating abuse i'm not i'm not trying to um, you know, make excuses for those who really were raised under some very difficult, difficult households. I get that. But you still have to remember that your parents are the parents that fed you, clothed you, took care of you, nursed you, worked so that you could have things, worked that you, could, you were able to go to school. In this regard, they were required, you were required to honor them. Honor them. Now he says, you shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not lie. Lie about anybody. You shall not covet. And again, this is the last commandment. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, nor his male servant, nor his female servant, nor his ox, nor his donkey, nor anything that is your neighbor's. Which means, and who is your neighbor? Everybody. Not just your next door neighbor, right? So it's who is your neighbor. So don't look at what anybody else has and desire that thing. And again, remember, this is what Paul says in Romans 7. This was an area that Paul struggled in. This was an area in, in, in Paul's life that he struggled in. And he, said, he, he really says it straight out in Romans chapter 7. I would not have even known that covetousness was a sin until I saw it written in the law. And then when I realized that it was a sin, I realized that number one, the law is spiritual. And number two, it slew me. It killed me. Because God is the only other one besides you who knows when you do this. When you covet, when you look at what somebody else has and you want that thing or you want that person, when you look at that, the only other person besides you who knows that you do that is God. And this is how Paul knows and knew and how we know that the law is more than just a list of do's and don'ts. It's actually spiritual and it's impossible. Right? I mean, remember, we talked a little bit about this last week in Galatians. The law was given to us as a tutor. The law was given to us as a guide, a watchman, if you would. The law was given to us to teach us and to guide us and to show us what perfection actually is and to show us that it is impossible to achieve. Now remember, in the days of Christ, they had twisted, and we're going to talk a little bit about it tonight, the, the Pharisees, uh, Sadducees, and you know, the members, other members of the Sanhedrin, the scribes even more so, had really twisted the law to make it achievable, to make perfection achievable. Now, remember, Saul of Tarsus, you guys know Paul used to be Saul of Tarsus, right? 
Saul of Tarsus, when he was Saul of Tarsus, he would say in Philippians 3 that according to the law, he was even blameless. The law had become an achievable goal, an attainable goal. And this is just like men. This is people. People like to, people like to make things, everything's, uh, <laughs> everything's a game. Everything's a challenge. You know, everything, everything we do, we always just like to, you know, we like to compete. Everything's a competition. We do. We just like to compete with one another. We like to hold up each other in front of ourselves and like to weigh ourselves by ourselves, comparing ourselves to one another. Well, I'm bad, but I'm not this bad, but I'm not that good. They're really good. I'm really bad. You know, we do this all the time. And then once we realize that that person is better than us, what do we start to do? We start to pick them apart and make them not better than us. We start to get all jealous and envious and angry, and then we start to rip them to pieces because then we start to covet what they have, and they think they're better than us. And, and this is what we do. This is life. This is the heart of man. This is what we do. This is the, this is, I'm going to tell you right now that covetousness is the sin that is behind most wars and conflicts in our world. Wanting power, wanting position, Wanting a piece of property that doesn't belong to you. To conquer a people because you want to be the most powerful. All of these things stem from covetousness. Very, very important for us to understand that. So he puts a mix. The Lord makes sure that he knows, that we know, rather, that it's always about the heart. It's always about the heart. Now, he gives us the law. He gives us the commandments, and he's going to expound on these over the course of the next couple of chapters, but he gives us the premise, and the premise is the relationship between God and the relationship between your neighbor, those around you. The first four commandments are all about your relationship to God. The final six are our relationship to man, mankind, our neighbor. And so don't covet. Now, in verse 18, this is where we pick it up tonight. Now, all the people, now remember, Remember, set the stage. This is God delivers the law from Mount Sinai himself, right? He delivers the law. He begins to speak from the great mountain himself. After he told Moses to gather up everybody, grab all the people, all the children of Israel, bring them to the foot of the mountain, but they can't go up it. Set a boundary. They can't go past the boundary. If they touch the mountain, they're going to die. If they go near it, they're going to be stoned. People will shoot them with arrows. They can't go near the mountain, but they've got to come to the foot. And he said, wash your clothes. Sanctify yourself. Wash your clothes. Come into the presence of God with clean clothes. Now, we know that we can't do these things on our own now. We understand that we cannot sanctify ourselves now. We know that we're only clean in the blood of Christ. Our, our, our robes, are on, the robes that we're given have been cleansed and washed in the righteousness of the Lord. Nonetheless, we are given clothes of white, robes of white in Revelation. We are given those things. We are given the righteousness of God. And so all of these things that he told them to do is all a type and a shadow pointing to those things. New life is a new way of living. That's how it goes. New life that they have. Listen, they've been set free. They're only three months out. Remember that, okay? They're only three months out of bondage. And so with new life comes a new way of living. With a new life, with, with the life that we've been given now in Christ, you realize that it, makes, it does us no good to continue in the old ways. It does us no good. So what God is going to do is he's going to set down the rules and the regulations for the rest of their life. And he's going to set a people apart, and he's going to make this people, this peculiar people, this very strange people, not mighty, not many. They're weak. They're not this great, mighty army. They're weak. Most of them, pretty weak at this stage of the game. They're not a well-known people, but the one thing they have is the true and the living God. And they're going to go, the fame of them is going to go out through all the land. Every nation around them is going to know who they are. Every nation around them is going to know who their God is. Every nation around them is going to know exactly who the children of Israel are. Remember, there's going to be a pillar 
of cloud by day going before them. And wherever this pillar moves, they go with it. And everyone's going to know about this, the, the people of the pillar. You know, everyone knows about the children of Israel. They're just following around this pillar of cloud. And then by night, you could see it for miles, for miles around. There's going to be a pillar of fire by night. And everyone's going to see it. All these other nations are going to see it. And they're going to know that this nation is different. And what God is doing is he's sanctifying a people because he wants to be hallowed in their eyes. And he's speaking these things from Mount Sinai. And remember, we talked a little bit about this last week as well. God delivers the law from Mount Sinai. This will be the last time. This is the last time that he speaks to the nation of Israel publicly by himself without a mediator until, until the Sermon on the Mount. That's a, kind of an amazing thing. We're going through the Sermon on the Mount now on Sunday. He sits down and he speaks with them and he gets some things clear. He gets some things, some issues in the law. He has to make these things clear because by the time Christ steps on the scene, the children of Israel and the religious leaders have so twisted the law. They've twisted the word of God, which is what we do. It, it would, nothing's changed. Things don't change. And they've twisted. They've twisted the law of God. They've twisted and they've made it this attainable thing. They've made the law, the word of God, which was supposed to be something that was going to set people free. They've made it so that now everybody that comes into Jerusalem, everyone that comes in during the time of Christ, everyone that comes into the nation of Israel, they take a look at how they're worshiping the only true God and most people don't want anything to do with it. They blaspheme the name of God. They've turned the word of God, the law of God, into a, into a sledgehammer to rule over the people, these religious leaders in the time of Christ. In verse 18, it says, Now now all the people witnessed the thunderings, the lightning flashes, the sound of the trumpet, and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, please note this, they trembled and stood afar off. Now listen, I read this and I laugh because you have to try and put, again, this happened, this really happened, okay? So, and this is kind of like where I go with it. You guys know I, I'm all about like putting yourself in the story. Imagine seeing this. Imagine, listen, we get our minds blown like 4th of July is coming up, right? 4th of July is coming up, and what do we do? We usually go someplace. We're going to be you know, blowing up some fireworks or whatever. Maybe they'll do it this year. Maybe they won't. I'm hoping they do. But, but we get our minds blown when they, you know, when they start at the very end, you know, at the finale. You know, it's kind of like, da 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 Right? It's just kind of like, you know, we all get our minds blown. It's like this amazing thing that we watch. And, every, you know, and all the kids like, whoa. You know, everyone's like, you know, freaking out, right? Please put yourself in this story. A mountain is on fire. Look it. A mountain is on fire. And God says, you got to come kind of close to the mountain a little bit, but don't come too close. And then in the midst of that, in the midst of a mountain being on fire, there is clouds and there's smoke and there's thunderings and there's lightnings and there's, brruh, brruh, there's trumpets blowing just all over the place. And this is like, you, you would uh, think that this would be like, wow, this is really cool. Let's, uh, let's go check this thing out. But the people look at this thing and they are scared to death. They're scared to death. And there's a reason for that. Because God wants his people... God wants you and he wants me and he wants his people to know that above anything and everything else, he is holy. He is holy. Listen to me. We live in a time, and I say that, I've been saying this for the last couple of weeks, but we're living in a time where that attribute of God is no longer even spoken of in the church, and it is sad. It's sad. Because, you know, we want to make Jesus friendly. We want to make him the Jesus. We want to make him really nice. We want to make him really cool and really acceptable. We want to just make him just kind of fit into our nice, neat little lives. And we understand, you know, we, we've come up with this concept in the church. You know, God just, you know, he accepts us just the way we are. We sing hymns about it. Just as I am with her, Right? And the great and the wonderful songs, and he does. He takes us in. But then some, for some reason, somewhere along the line, the body of Christ, leaders of the church, have missed the reality of the holiness of God. 
He's holy, man. And he should be revered as such. And we miss that, man. We miss this in our prayers. We miss the reality of this. We miss this in our prayers. We miss this in our Bible time. We miss this in our church attendance. We don't want to come to church because, you know, that church down there, they just don't do things the way we do. Listen, you miss, you're miss, missing it, man. If you have ever attended a church that really teaches and holds fast to the Word of God only, sola scriptura, if you go to a church that really teaches that Christ, God reveals Himself in His Word primarily, then that's a good church. <laughs> that's a good church. That teaches the holiness of God. The holiness of God. That's something that's really missing today. And dare I say that if it was something that we really took a hold of, if the truth of ho the holiness of God was something that we really took a hold of, it would affect your life. It would. It would affect your life. If you really grasped that, if that was something you really understood, it would affect your life. If you stepped into the presence of a holy God and you really understood what that meant, you really under you, you took to heart the brevity of what that meant, it would affect your life more than any other thing, more than any other pastor, preacher, any other doctrine. I'm telling you right now, the holiness of God. So much that they trembled. Now again, in verse 18, it says, All the people witnessed the thunderings, and the thunderings and the lightnings, and the word for lightnings, it's the same word, please note this, it's the same word for torches, flashes, or quote-unquote kind of fireballs. It's the same word to show God's presence in the making of the Abrahamic covenant in Genesis 15, 17. Remember in Genesis 15, what does Abraham see? Right? Okay, so all day, Genesis 15, Abraham's chasing away birds, right? He takes a couple of carcasses, cuts them in half. He's waiting for God to show up, and he's chasing away vultures all day long, chasing away birds all day long. And then later on that night, a deep sleep comes over Abraham, and what happens? It's a deep darkness, is what the Bible says. Deep darkness falls over him. He falls asleep, and then what does Abraham see? He sees an oven, smoldering oven. And what do we see here? We see a smoldering mountain. And then he sees torches, or a torch. And this is exactly what we see here. Torches, many of them. Lightnings, balls of light. It's the same word. And these things show God's presence. Both an oven in the mountain, and torches, and lightning flashes. And they trembled. And listen, I want to say this to you, and you guys know this. We hear this all the time. You guys have friends, and I do too. You have friends who don't really understand the presence of God. And what they'll say is this. When I get to heaven, the big guy's got some explaining to do. You ever have somebody say that? Yeah, me too. And I have to tell them <clears throat> with the utmost love and compassion that you don't know what you're talking about. You're going to get into the presence of God and you're going to fall down on your face just like Isaiah did in Isaiah 6, 1 through 5. Fell down on his face and said, Woe is me, I'm a man of unclean lips. You're going to come into the presence of God and you're going to fall on your face just like John did in Revelation 1, verse 17. He fell on his face as a dead man in the presence of Christ. Please make no mistake about that. When people start talking about the big guy upstairs, he's going to have some explaining to do. They have no clue what they're talking about. Thank the Lord that the grace of the Lord is with them. You know what he would say to people like that? I'm just going to say this to you. and just, just to kind of set our hearts right. He would say the same thing that he said on the cross as they would revile him. He would say, Lord, forgive them. Father, forgive them for they know, know, know not what they do. People say those things because they have no idea who they're talking about. The world says those things because they have no idea who Christ really is. And we're going to give them a little bit of grace, and I do but I make sure that they know who it is that they're talking about. When they use the name of Jesus as a punchline or as a swear word, I don't let them get away with it. I say, well, that's a name. How come you don't use the name Buddha? How come you don't use the name Muhammad? How come you don't blaspheme another name? Why is it that name that you go to? I just make sure they know it. I don't judge them. But that's the name that's been given. 
above every other name, the name of Jesus. And at that name, every knee shall bow. Every knee shall bow. Every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. No one is going to make God explain anything. No one. But I just want to say this to you. He's already explained what he needs to explain. By his grace and by his mercy, he has given us his word and he has explained everything to us. By his exceeding mercy and his goodness, he has laid out for us, all of us, in his word, everything that he wants us to know concerning him, his character, his attributes, and who we are and what it is that we're doomed for if we don't receive Christ. And that's the truth. And they trembled. They trembled, and that's the proper response to the presence of God. And they stood afar off. And then in verse 19, it says, Then they said to Moses, You speak with us, and we will hear. But let not God speak with us, speak with us, lest, lest we die. And it's just interesting, because now, again, the children of Israel are going to do something that a lot of people do, and they're going to start to make promises that they can't keep. They're going to say things. They're going to make promises. They're going to say, no problem. You tell us, you tell us the law, we'll listen. No problem. Right? And so like this is kind of, you know, this is, the, this is the heart of every baby believer. You get that, right? Every baby believer has this. We all have these moments. And we have had these moments. Okay, Lord, that's it. My life, it's all new. Anything you tell me to do, you set me free. Hallelujah. I will do anything and everything you tell me to do. No problem. I, you got a friend in me, man. And we start singing the song. You got a friend in me. I'm, I'm ready. I am ready. I am a soldier. I am, I, my life is completely changed. And then we wake up the next day. And it's over. That promise is shot. That covenant is shot. The only one that keeps covenants is the Lord. The only one. The only one who holds on to his promises is the Lord Jesus. He's the only one. The only one who makes a covenant and keeps it and whose word is solid, it is a rock, is God Almighty. That's it. And they said to Moses, you speak and we will hear. And if the promises of men, and they don't mean much, remember in John 2, Jesus did not commit himself to them, that's to mankind, because he knew all men and had no need that anyone should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. You realize that even in John's gospel, he records that the Lord knew what was in man. The heart of a man, Jeremiah would tell us, is deceitful and wicked above all things. Who can know it? God knows people, man. He does. He's known us from the beginning. And so there's nothing that happens that kind of, you know, that blindsides the Lord. Sometimes we think that that happens. Things surprise us. They blindside us all the time. We make, we make mistakes. Mistakes. We unintentionally do things or intentionally, you know, get into a backslide or whatever. These things surprise us. And then when we do these things, when mistakes happen, we start to doubt God and doubt his power. Meanwhile, God knew all along the mistake we were going to make. This is why the payment, the atonement for our sins is eternal. It's the sins you have committed and the sins that you will commit. That's why it's so important for us to understand substitutionary atonement. Because he knows what's in man. And the promise to hear Moses had been so twisted by the time Christ arrived. It had been so convoluted that they actually thought that they could actually adhere to certain areas of the law. People, mankind had twisted twisted the law into making it this very attainable thing. And the other thing it shows is that man wants a mediator. And that desire is only good if the mediator is in fact Christ. And it is because we know that that's what the Lord tells us. That there is only one mediator. One. There is only one mediator between man and God. That is the man, Jesus Christ in First Timothy. There's only one. But the interesting thing here is that God knows that there are some people who just want to worship the Lord at a distance. Okay? Now, remember, you've heard me say this before. I'll say it again. God doesn't have favorites. The Lord doesn't have favorites. Everybody's his favorite. All my kids are my favorite. Right? They're all my favorite. I don't play favorites. They're just all my favorite. They're different. 
each personality different, which is kind of amazing. You get three kids from the same two people, they're all different. They're all different. They're different. But there are some God calls to be intimates. He doesn't have favorites, but he has intimates. And some people like to just worship God from afar off. They like to just worship God from a distance. They like to just, you know, just kind of be the, I don't know if you want to, it's a, for lack of a better term, they're just, you know, just a kind of a part-time believer. You know what I mean? And they worship God at a distance. Things start to get really intense with your relationship with the Lord, and sometimes you just kind of back off. Really quick, turn with me to Exodus. Exodus, I'm sorry, I'm, we are in Exodus. Exodus chapter 33. I know, I know. Exodus chapter 33. Exodus chapter 33 and verse 12, it says this, Then Moses said to the Lord, See, you say to me, Bring up, bring up this people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. Yet you have said, I know you by name. And you have also found grace in my sight. Now, therefore, I pray. Now, this is Moses talking to God. Now, therefore, I pray. If I, if I have found grace in your sight, show me now your way that I may know you and that I may find grace in your sight. And consider that this nation is your people. And he said, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. Then he, that's Moses, said to him, if your presence does not go with us, do not bring us up from here. In other words, if you aren't going to go with us, then we don't even want to go. For how then will it be known that your people and I have found grace in your sight, except you go with us? So we shall separate your people. So we sh rather shall be separate, your people and I, from all people who are upon the face of the earth. And then in verse 17, it says this. So the Lord said to Moses, I will also do this thing that you have spoken, for you have found grace in my sight, and I know you, please note this, by name. And he said, Moses, Moses says, please show me your glory. Listen, God doesn't have favorites, but he has intimates. There are going to be some people who see the thunderings and see the lightnings and see all of the, the wondrous mountain of fire. And they're going to back off. They're going to worship God from a distance. But then there are going to be some who really want to press in. Then there are going to be some who really want to see and feel and sense and understand and know God on a deeper, intimate level through his word. Some people are really going to press in by prayer. Somebody going to really press in in their time with the Word. And I'm going to tell you right now, you have as much of God as you want. You have as much of God as you want. You see, Moses, he was an intimate. He wanted to really press in. You see, the disciples, even, even amongst the 12 disciples, the Lord had his disciples, but he also had his intimates. He had Peter, James, and John. And for a while, they were Andrew. He had his intimates. And then he had Peter and John. Those were the ones that were really close to him. And notice that those were the ones that usually caused him the most trouble. <laughs> Peter was the one who was usually being told. He was the only one in the world, certainly, that was told by God to shut up. <laughs> Almost literally that way. But he was the closest to the Lord. Do you understand that? He was the closest. He was intimate. He really, listen, he loved Jesus for who he was. Do you understand that? There's a difference. Loving God for who he is and just loving God for what he does for you is different. Loving God and taking him in and really knowing Christ and really wanting to press in because he loves you first. 
is different than just loving God because he keeps you clean, keeps you sober, keeps you fed, keeps money in your pocket, keeps a house over you. That all of those things are wonderful things and all those things are incredibly loving of God to do all those things, yes. But the true intimate is going to want to press in and know him more and forget all the other things. Forget all the other things. Forget everything else. Forget all the material things. Forget all the money. Take it. Take it. Whatever. But to know Christ, to know him, and the fellowship, Paul would say, of his suffering. That is someone who really wants to know God. The intimate. The intimate. The one who really wants to press in, man who will labor in prayer day and night. And it's nothing to them. Listen, offenses will come. Growing up in Christ, offenses will come. People will offend you in the church. People will offend you. You know, you know what's funny to me? People will always give more grace to people in the world than they do in the church. Somebody says something offensive to you in the church, all of a sudden it's, oh! Somebody says something offensive to you out in the world and you just kind of shrug it off. It should be the opposite. You should be giving more grace to the body of Christ. More grace for the people that offend you here in this body. More grace for the people who are believers. More grace for the bride of Jesus Christ. And it's going to happen. But you know what? The person who's really looking to press in to know God is going to understand that these offenses will happen. That these things are going to happen. That troublesome times are going to happen. And that offenses are going to come and people are going to say all sorts of things against you falsely. And when those things happen, the person who really wants to press in isn't going to care. Isn't going to care. It is what it is. And you're just going to roll on. And then there are some who just like to worship from afar off. And that's okay. God loves them too. It's his children. But they worship afar off. And so they start to make a covenant. It doesn't really go anywhere. And the people stood afar off, but Moses drew near. He drew near the thick darkness. Please note this where God was. Do you see that? He drew near. Moses wanted to press in, man. He, didn't, he wasn't afraid of anything. He'd seen God deliver. He would fir- he'd witnessed all of the wonderful things that the Lord had done to free the children of Israel. And he was used by God in a mighty way to deliver these messages to Pharaoh. And he wanted to know what and who he was serving. He wanted to know him more. He drew near. And then the Lord said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, You have seen that I have talked with you from heaven. And they did. They saw that. You have seen, rather. You have seen that I have talked with you from heaven. You shall not make anything to be with me, gods of silver or gods of gold. You shall not make for yourselves an altar of earth. You shall make for me... And you shall sacrifice on it your burnt offerings and your peace offerings, your sheep and your oxen in every place where I record, please note this, my name, I will come to you and I will bless you. The interesting thing about this is that he's already implementing a sacrificial system. Why? Because he knows that they couldn't do it. God knew that they would, all the law had been given. He'd been given in the Ten Commandments. And immediately after the law, you guys hear me say this all the time, right after the law was given, he gives them the sacrificial system. When you start to make a sacrifice, when you start to make a trespass offering, when you, when you do all of these things, he's going to get into how this is all supposed to be laid out, by the way. And it's worth noting that as we go through these chapters, If there's any one thing, we talked a little bit about this when we went through 1 Corinthians. If there's one thing that God is, truly He is a God of order. He wants things done right. He wants the people, He wants His people, His sanctified people, His called out people to worship Him properly. You understand, this is is why it's so important for us to get into the Word of God. Remember on Sunday, I was preaching through Matthew. In Matthew chapter 7, Ask, seek, and knock. 
right? This is a prayer, a prayer lifestyle that has really kind of, that the church has veered away from. We, we got this kind of funky prayer thing going on that's been going on in the church for like decades now, where people will demand things of God. They demand them, they, they, they claim them in Jesus' name, and they demand these things that God is not delivering on. You understand? They demand things in Jesus' name in some sort of authority that they claim according to the scripture, but nothing, with, nothing about how they're praying is biblical. Nothing about what they're asking for or how they're asking, how they're approaching a holy God is biblical because what the Lord says to do is when you come to the Father and you pray for things which you should do, He says simply to ask. You know not to just hand out your list of demands to God. Ask. Seek. Knock. And it's continual. But then he goes on, he expounds on that, that any man who asks, he delivers. And we, you know, again, in kind of a church culture, we've come out of this, we've come into this very strange demanding prayer lifestyle. We're demanding things of God. I thank you, Jesus, that you have given me this in Jesus' name. And then all of a sudden, man, people just expect things to just happen. And it's really strange. There's no reverence there. There's no respect, man. There's no honor. There is no understanding who it is that you're talking to. Do you understand that, yes, he is your father. Yes, we have boldness. Yes, we have access. Yes, we can enter into his presence where our spirit cries out, Abba, Father. Yes, all of those things are true. He has called us heirs and co-heirs in Christ, sons and daughters. He has called us from afar off and brought us near. All of those things are true. But there is something irreverent in the way that we talk to God these days, man. There really is. There's something irreverent about how the church has chosen to speak with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. There is something irreverent. And there's something really, it speaks volumes for what the church and what the leaders of the church have made God out to be. He is loving, He is gracious. He is our Father. And dare I say that none of us in here would speak to our earthly fathers that way. We just wouldn't. We would never speak to our earthly fathers that way. Yet somehow, for some reason, when it comes to speaking to our Heavenly Father, we feel as if we can take some license to treat Him, disrespect, treat him disrespectfully and irreverently. To start demanding things that are not really ours to demand. But nonetheless, God, he, he implements the sacrificial system because he knows man. He knows what's in man. He knows that all the promises that mankind is trying to make, they'll never be able to keep. He's laid out the law, and the law, simply put, it was just to show that sin is sin, and that perfection in this age, perfection on our end, is unattainable. Right? And then in verse 25, he says this, and if you make, now note this, please. And if you make an altar of stone, you shall not build it of hewn stone. For if you use your tool, if you use your tool on it, you have profaned it. Please note that. He's going to expound on this in verse 26. Nor shall you go up by steps to my altar, that your nakedness may not be exposed on it. You see, the focus must be on the worship not the altar. And God's not going to share His glory with anyone. He's not. He's not going to share His glory with anybody who really kind of makes a really great altar, right? Because this is kind of like where we are now. This is where we are as a church. This stuff was written thousands of years ago. It speaks today. It speaks right now. God doesn't care about what kind of building you got. He doesn't care about the show, man. And all too often times, and listen, this is not just modern evangelical churches that have like multi-million dollar buildings. I'm talking about old school cathedrals. You guys have seen them. You go to those cathedrals, and we've seen them, and they're gorgeous, and they're wonderful. You ever see some of the flying buttresses from Europe? I mean, just unbelievable churches built in the name of Jesus, right? Unbelievable. The amount of craftsmanship in the work, and listen, by the way, when he gets into building the temple, the temple is going to be something to behold really is 
but he don't care about any of that. Do you understand? He doesn't care about any of that because, listen, really quick. Turn with me to John, John chapter 4. He nails this down. The Lord really explains well what he's looking for. John chapter 4. We'll start, this is a good, you know, this is a great story. We got a couple of minutes. We'll just read the whole thing. John chapter 4. In verse 4, but he needed to go through Samaria. So he came to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob gave to Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, therefore, being wearied from his journey, sat thus by the well. And it was about the sixth hour. A woman of Samaria came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. And then the woman of Samaria said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink of me, a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. And Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God, and who it is who says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him. And he would have given you living water. And the woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as well as his sons and his livestock? And Jesus answered and said to her, Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst but the water that i shall give him will become notice in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life and the woman said to him sir give me this water that i may not thirst nor come here to draw and jesus said to her go call your husband and come here now please note this this is where the lord really starts to get down to the heart he's never just going to let us be he's not the Lord will never let us be. He loves you too much to just let you be and think that he's dumb. He's not dumb. He knows what's going on in your heart. He knows what's going on in your mind. He knows what's going on in your life. And the worst thing that you can do is try to hide that from him because he already knows. Ready? He goes right to it. He says, go call your husband and come here. And the woman answered and said, I have no husband. And Jesus said to her, you have well said, you have well said that I have no husband. For you have had five husbands. And the one whom you now have is not your husband, and that you spoke truly. Do you see that? She took some time to be honest, to just get real. And because of that, he blessed her. And the woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshiped on this mountain. And you Jews say that in Jerusalem is the place where one ought to worship. And Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour is coming, and please note this, now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. Do you see that? God has not changed. He's not looking at the glory of the altar he's not looking at the bricks and mortar he's not looking at people building him a temple he's telling telling the children of israel he's saying listen when you build it, build an altar just make it out of earth make it out of stone and when you get the stones make sure you don't put your hammer and your chisel to them so that everybody can take a look at how great the altar looks and really give people a pat on the back for how wonderful it looks make an altar of earth and put the sacrifice on top of that and when you do that and you got to put rocks around it make sure the rocks are just earthy rocks nothing special because i want people to focus on me 
not the altar. I want true worshipers to worship me in spirit and in truth, and the true followers of God will do that. True worshipers of Jesus will do that. They will worship him in spirit and truth. They will worship him for who he is, not just what they get. Not just what we get. And then she continues in verse 25. The woman said to him, I know the Messiah is coming, who is called the Christ. And when he comes, he will tell us all things. And Jesus said to her, please note this, I who speak to you am. Please note this. So important. Get this. That he is in italics. It's not in there. He says, I who speak to you, who am speaking to you right now, I am. You know, it was the first time that he ever really disclosed who exactly he was to this woman, the Samaritan woman by the well. The first person he disclosed who he was was to this woman. This woman who was a little brash at first. A little brazen. Had no idea who she was talking to. But when she realized who it was, her response is remarkable. And at this point, the disciples came and they marveled that he had talked to a woman. Yet no one said, what do you seek or why are you talking with her? And then the woman left her water pot, went her way into the city and said to the men, come and see a man who told me all things that I ever did. Could this be the Christ? You see her response? She immediately turns into a worshiper and an evangelist. She turns into a worshiper. The progression of this conversation is really unbelievable. But the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New, Pe- New Testament, the God of the age that we're living in right now is still seeking the same to worship him. People who worship him for who he is. People who will hallow his name. People, people who will worship the great I am because he is worthy of all worship, praise, honor, and glory. That's what he's looking for. Not just people to build temples and to do stuff for him or who worship him because he does stuff for them, but for people who really want to press in and know the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And listen, if you've got a mindset that just gets hemmed up over small things, you have to bring these things to the Lord. I don't care how long you've been walking with the Lord. Whether it's a year, 20 years, 30 years, I don't care. You got things in your mind and you got a laundry list of stuff. You go to the Lord with arguments sometimes. I know I do too. You go to God and you argue with Him about how things are going in your life, right? How things are happening, how things are just kind of unraveling, and, you know, how things aren't really going your way. I do this sometimes too. We complain. But you got to reset. You got to reset. You have to reset and you have to draw back and you have to understand that He's not looking for people to worship him because of what he's doing or what he's not doing. The Lord is looking for people to worship him in spirit and in truth because of who he is. This is lost in the church, and dare I say, even sometimes it's lost in my own life. But the more you press in, the more he'll reveal himself to you. The more you press in to knowing Christ, to knowing the true and living God, to knowing him, the more he will reveal himself to you. The more you stay and listen to who it is who is speaking with you, he's speaking to you even right now, the more he will reveal himself to you. And you'll get to know him. And the more you get to know him, the more you get to love him. And the more you get to know him, the closer he'll bring you in. He'll bring you in even closer and closer. And you think you can't get any closer and he'll just draw you in even more to the point where even sometimes you'll be praying and you just buckle to your knees. There's been a couple of times in my life where that's happened. Where the presence of the Lord was so intense all by myself. No one else around. Just in prayer. And he just buckles you to your knees and you just cry out to the Lord and you say, woe is me, I'm a man of unclean lips. And just the grace and the mercy of God just washes over you with wave after wave after wave. And your heart will change to where you'll be able to worship God anywhere under any circumstances, not just at church on Sundays, not just in or out of air conditioning, 
not just in or out of uncomfortable chairs or comfortable chairs or whatever. You'll be able to worship the Lord, the Lord anywhere. Amen? Amen. Heavenly Father, we love you. We praise you. I thank you, Lord, for this night. I thank you, Lord, for your word. I thank you, Lord, for bringing us out here this evening and just speaking to us, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for revealing more of who you are to us. The challenge that you give each one of us, Lord, to press in, to know you, Lord, that you would just continue to do this in this age. Lord, that you would continue to set us apart. Lord, a peculiar people. Lord, that you would just continue to set aside the church, Lord, to refine us, Lord, in the days that we're, that we're living in right now, Lord, that we're so much of the church, so many in the church, Lord, being refined and being tested, as it were, Lord. As you would test your people in the wilderness, Lord, the church even right now, the body of Christ being tested. I pray, Lord, that you would refine us, Lord. We know that these things that we go through, Lord, these, these difficulties and these challenges, Lord, these things that we experience, they are for our good, Lord. They refine us as fine gold or silver. I pray, Lord, that in this time, that we would be willing to receive all that you have for us, Lord, and that we would truly be worshipers who worship you for who you are. In a time, Lord, where so much of the church, where, Lord, where so much of the body of Christ has drifted away from the reality of your holiness and your goodness. We have treated you as a genie, Lord. We've treated you as just a, a doer for us. Rather, Lord, than understanding that we are servants of you. I pray, Lord, that tonight we would leave here changed, challenged, encouraged, Lord. We love you. We praise you. Bring us back here together, Lord, on Sunday. Continue, Lord, to be with us. Lord, bless these ministries that we have going on here, Lord, and so many that just need prayer. We're praying for those who need physical healing even right now. The time of prayer that you've given us in these weeks coming up here, Lord, I pray, Lord, that you would bless them. But, Lord, that we would know you, Lord, in the midst of all of this, personally, for each one of us here, that, Lord, that we would know you. That each one of us would take time to press in and get to know the true and the living God in Jesus Christ whom you have sent, Lord, that we would know you. And that this is what we would value, Lord, to know you. Bless us as we go. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you guys. We will see you here next week.